Welcome to the What You Next podcast. In this podcast, your host, Lori Amin, will interview published authors to chat about their work, journey to getting published, and their book recommendations. If you share a passion for books and are always looking for your next read, then join us. Hi, Carrie. Welcome to What You Next podcast. Hey, have, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. I'm so excited to chat with you. Show us a little bit about yourself. A little bit about me. Well, um, I am a writer and I lived outside of Boston, Massachusetts in a, in a lovely suburb. Um, and I, I, I have a, an 11 year old going on 15 year old daughter. (laughs) Um, and I have, uh, um, a lovely dog who is, is, you know, is actually on this podcast in the background. Um, and, uh, I have my third historical novel is coming out, um, called the Paris bookseller. And I'm really excited to, uh, chat with you about that. So I want to chat about historical novel. Like what was like, did you, did you, were you a historical fiction reader and that inspire you? Or what was the point of inspiration to start writing historical novels? Cause I'm always curious about that. Yeah. You know, um, qu- about 10 years ago, I read The Paris Wife by Paula mm-hmm. McLean, which I feel like is one of these like real like flashpoint novels for a lot a lot of writers of historical fiction. And, you know, it's about Hadley Richardson, um, Hemingway's first wife, and it was set in Paris in the 20s, you know, not, not unlike my, the book that's coming out of mine. And at the time, you know, I read it and I was very, in, myself, I was embroiled in the world of young adult fiction. I had no idea of writing an adult historical novel myself, but I I was just swept away by The Paris Wife, and I kind of filed it away in my mind under good to know. Like, it's interesting that, you you know, a writer could could take on a subject like this in a historical novel. Um, And then kind of flash forward about five years, I stumble on the story of one of John F. Kennedy's younger sisters. Her name was Kathleen Kennedy. She went by the name Kick. And her story was just amazing. Um, And her true real life story was just amazing. And I thought, I I just immediately started seeing it in my mind as a novel. And I remembered The Paris Wife. And I thought, well, wow, you know, maybe I too could write a novel like The Paris Wife, but about this woman named Kit Kennedy. And here I am three books later, um doing exactly that so that's that's the nutshell version I love this like you know like a book can inspire you to just and a, and a person in history can take yeah. it to the next level and just like go down the rabbit hole and then create a story that people can actually learn something about yes. it so yes yes huh. you know people readers of historical fiction um, I always ask, you know, when their eyes light up and when I tell them that I write historical fiction, they're like, oh gosh, historical fiction is my favorite. And I always say, why? And inevitably they say, it's because I get to learn something at the same time that I get absorbed in a great story. And I, I always respond, that's exactly why I like to write it. <laughs> I don't just toppled over my ring light, but I don't need the ring light. So <laughs> It's um, okay. <laughs> It's so good. So let's chat out the Paris bookseller. It's also okay. all over a pitch. Yeah. All right. So the Paris bookseller is um, the story of, of a Sylvia Beach, the amazing American woman who came to Paris uh, at the end of the First World War and opened the original Shakespeare and Company bookstore in Paris. Mm-hmm. And it was the home of the lost generation. Uh, all the, you know, all the famous uh, writers that you know, expat writers that you know of from the 1920s, um, F. Scott Fitzgerald, Gertrude Stein, Ernest Hemingway, Ezra Pound, T.S. Eliot, they all went to Shakespeare and Company and to some extent made it their second home in Paris. She, not only was she a bookstore and lending library, she was a postal service. She was a concierge. She, she really was the sort of the keys to the kingdom of Paris in the 1920s. Um, And in addition to all that, as if that wasn't enough, she also published the very first edition of James Joyce's novel, Ulysses in 1922, following um, a pretty famous um, and infamous in some ways trial that happened in New York City in 1921 that banned the novel. It, it may, it convicted the novel of obscenity. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, and so she, from her perch in Paris was like, 
I think this book is very important and still needs to be published and read. And so she published an English version, English language version of it from Paris um, and found a way to smuggle it back into the United States alongside the illegal liquor, because of course this was also the twenties, the era of prohibition. So um, it was a great story. So what was, what was it like to go down to rabbit hole of researching? You know, yeah. So you know, this was you know, unlike my previous two novels, um, I, I was able to bring almost like a whole adulthood of reading to this novel because I've always been entranced by the uh, Paris of the twenties and the writing of the twenties. You know, so I had read F. Scott Fitzgerald's novels and Hemingway's novels and quite and Juna Barnes and quite a, quite a number of other um, writers that Sylvia refers to in her own memoir as the crowd. <laughs> um, and in fact, I had she so Sylvia Beach wrote her own memoir. It's a very it's a very slim little book um, that I discovered in college when I was a young undergrad obsessed with the writers of the 20s. I found uh, a used copy of her memoir, like in a, you know, those book bins in front of bookstores full of used dollar, dollar $1 used books. So I, I bought her book and I read it and I, I just, I was, it was an amazing story. And I, it, it, not unlike the Paris wife, I kind of filed it away in my mind under good to know. Um, and so I've been carrying her story around with me for more than 20 years. Um, it's actually, what's actually more amazing to me is that it took me that this long to realize that she needed a novel of her own. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, other, uh, you know, there were, uh, on the subject of the many rabbit holes I could have gone down for this book, um, there were many, many, many more that I could have. I actually had to be very disciplined in my research for this book because it's about my book. All them, almost all the main characters are writers. Um, they have written whole bodies of work on their own. And then they, there are letters of theirs that have been published biographies, in some cases, autobiographies. I could have spent decades just researching these people. So I had to kind of figure out what felt like the right amount of research so that I could go forth and write my own novel <laughs> um, in a responsible way that would be authentic and well-researched and historically accurate, um, but where I could also, you know, fill in some gaps with my imagination and, and create a, you know, a compelling novel um, for people to read now. So. I love this. Yeah. And so what was the process of writing during pandemic? Was it any easier, any harder, you know? You know, I talk a little bit about this in my um, in my author's note in the novel, but so I did, I actually wrote and um, wrote most of the first draft and certainly revised all of it during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, there's, there's a lot I could say about juggling, you know, having a kid who was, you know, at home doing school from home. And um, I was not like homeschooling her per se. She was doing remote school for, for her public school classes. Um, and like I, from most parents, you know, working parents that I know, it was much harder at the beginning, you know, when the, when the, when the pandemic originally hit and we went into our, all of our first lockdowns and no one knew what was going on or what anyone was doing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I just, I worked more slowly um, mm -hmm. um, and it got much better, you know, um, it, it got much better as time went on. So I was able to, continue writing even with my daughter home significantly more than I, than she was normally. Um, but, you know, I think one of the amazing and wonderful things about the pandemic for this particular book was the fact that I was writing about this world famous and world changing independent bookstore at the same time that independent bookstores all over the world and our country were changing book selling because, because of the pandemic. And so I had this like enormous affection. I mean, I've always had affection for independent bookstores. I worked in an independent bookstore when I first graduated from college and I was writing my very first novel. So I've always, you know, and obviously I have a, a fondness for Shakespeare and company. Um, but um, I just, I saw, you know, booksellers 
all over rise to the occasion of this pandemic and figure out ways of putting their book selling online, their events online, um, their, their book clubs online, and really transforming the whole landscape of, of books and book selling, you know, this hundred years after my book takes place. So that was really it was kind of inspiring in the background for me as, as I was writing this book. I feel like the parallel in some ways is like a shifting, you know, the shift that happens, and, you know, a hundred years later. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. You know, that was another funny thing, sort of like not related to books and book selling, but like there's a, the, in my novel, um, no spoilers, this isn't a big spoiler. There's, there's an interesting way in which the post office gets used in my novel as an instrument of censorship. <laughs> and there we were a hundred years later with the post office getting blamed <laughs> um, for, um, you know, election problems. And I, I just, I just thought to myself, gosh, the poor post office, you know, I really, they were just designed to deliver the mail. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, so, but that was another sort of funny like never would have predicted kind of resonance with what was happening a hundred years ago that I was writing about in my novel that I was living through this sort of like latter day post office crisis. Yeah. Um, oh my gosh. Yeah. I just realized I was like, yeah, the post office, it, it feels like 2020 and 2021 are like one continuous year. And I don't like, I have like no sense of time or what happened a year ago because they're all the same it all mixed together and I forgot that we had the elections like you know. it's really really true I mean I remember you remember at the end of 2020 when like all like the you know all of the like the dumpster fire memes and like yeah. we're finally getting rid of 2020 and we're gonna 2021 was gonna have to be better and surely it has been better vaccine yeah. certainly it's better but to your point there's been a lot of bleed <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see what the end of 2021 um kind of like meme become. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll see. Um, by the time this airs, we'll we we'll know what new meme is. That's true. That's true. That's true. <laughs> All right. So let's chat book recommendations. Do you have any books that you recommend our listeners to pick up? Yeah, so I, I took a little bit of a different angle to, on this question, um, which I hope will be fun. I am a huge audiobook listener. Yes. Um, I, as I mentioned, as my my dog took down my ring light earlier, um, and so I walk my dog a lot. And I try once I realized at some point that I could use this as an opportunity to read. <laughs> and mm -hmm. and I to those listeners out there who are wondering, is audiobook listening really reading? Yes. yes is hundred <laughs> percent. I endorse audiobook listening completely. And so, by the way, to Stephen King, <laughs> um, he wrote a wonderful book on writing in which he talks about being a devoted audiobook listener. Um, so anyway, so I thought I would talk about um, a few of my favorite recent audio books and, and that, that are, I think, I did not read them with my eyeballs, um, but I know that they would be just as good if you were to read them with your eyeballs as opposed to your ears. Um, but I think that they were kind of spe especially good audio books. Um, so I'm going to start with one by Stephen Rowley called The Gunkle. Mm -hmm. um, it came out this lad this summer, um, and it is just like a, a charming and poignant um, story of um, a, a gay uncle, hence the gunkle. Um, I have a gunkle of my own, <laughs> um, as a side note. Um, so who winds up spending the summer with his two, um, his niece and nephew, his brother's children, uh, following a kind of sort of a, a, a double barreled family tragedy. I'm, I'm no, no spoilers. Um, but I think one of the things that made the gunkle as a, an audiobook, especially great, um, is the fact that Stephen, the author, read it. Really? Yes. Oh my yes. gosh. And I, I have to admit, I, you know, so I know Stephen. Stephen and I have been on a few panels together recently because um, a previous novel of each of ours involved the Kennedys. He wrote, he wrote a novel called The Editor that was about um, 
one of, the, one of the main Jackie Kennedy was one of the main characters. And I, as I was talking about earlier, I wrote about um, Kick Kennedy. So he and I kind of got to know each other through our Kennedy connection. And I was so excited when the Gunkle came out, it just looked fabulous. And so I listened to it and I just uh, absolutely fell in love with it. And he reads it and he just does a remarkable job. And, you know, I feel like I'm a, I'm a pretty jaded audiobook listener at this point. Like really the reader really makes a big difference in your enjoyment of the, of the audiobook. And so I was worried. I was like, oh, an author reading it, but he, it was, he just like absolutely hit it out of the park. I mean, it, you know, it's, it, it's absolutely terrific. Um, and, and I feel, I feel also like the fact that the author, he was the author reading it, it lent a certain authority to the audiobook. It's, you know, he got to read it with his own intention in the inflections and in the um, the exclamations and 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 all of that. So I thought it was really, really, really well done. I see you nodding. I, I, I um, others of us can't see. We can see each other, but like, have you have you also read the Gunkel? The Gunkel has been mentioned so many times because it deals with grief and it deals with like just this, you know, setting. And I'm like, I and now I'm thinking about like. Now you mentioned there's an author reading the book. And I'm like, I just need to check whatever has it. If not, I'll buy it, you know, yeah. <laughs> because yeah. it's going to be my next book, like tonight, <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's really, I mean, it's really, it's really great. And as we're entering colder months, mm -hmm. it's set in Palm Springs in the summer. So yeah. it's all sparkling pools and like caftans and it's really it's a great winter escape kind of novel too so i i, I endorse it on that level also yes um okay so another terrific book um that was also just a special audio book is daisy jones and the six yes by tara jenkins have you listened to it i, I was like, uh full class audio and i listened i read i read it like a couple of times and yeah. just it's getting better and better you know <laughs> Yeah, I believe it. And I, I, you know, they're making it into a movie and I can't wait to see the movie. I mean, it's a great novel, right? It's a great story, you know, so compelling with all the different characters um, coming together to tell the story and like responding to each other in, in interesting ways in which in the, the way in which the the story of this band from the seventies is like pieced together. And there's like a kind of a central mystery to it. And it's just such a page turner, but as you said, the full cast recording, which has, you know, Jennifer Beale and Benjamin Bratt and, you know, a, you know, a handful of other really just amazing um, actors and readers is, it just makes it a special, special audio book. So mm -hmm. um, I, I, I love that one. Yes, that's um, <laughs> yeah. And then you know another one that I thought um, was a great audiobook was "Born a Crime" by Trevor Noah, mm -hmm. um, which is a memoir um, that he himself. Uh, this is another one. He wrote the book and he and he um, did the audio recording. But I guess this one's a little less surprising than the fact that Stephen Rowley read his own because I don't think of Stephen as an actor, but like obviously, you know, Trevor Noah is an entertainer. Um, but again, I mean, he's a gifted entertainer and I'm not a big late night television watcher. So I barely heard of him before I listened to his audio book. And so I, you know, talk about a book where you learn a lot while getting like swept up in an amazing, like in his case, true story. Mm -hmm. I learned, so, he's from South Africa. I learned so much about South Africa and apartheid and, and the effects of it, you know, on, on many generations of people living there. Um, it was really a remarkable book. I, it was so, and it was so, and on top of all of that, it was so moving. Um, and the fact that he's an entertainer, you know, he's able to, to kind of pair humor and tragedy, um, in the book in a really unique and effective way. And, and the way he reads it just builds on that. You know, it's really, it's, it's very exciting as, as a, I hadn't actually planned on mentioning this one, um, but as another memoir, that was a great audio book, but not read by the author is educated. Yeah. Um, did you read, did you listen I to did. that one? I read it. It was so good. Yeah. So good. Such a, like really a tough read, right? Yeah. Like 
tough, like really hard subject, um, some, some intense violence and, um, personal, you know, you know, deep, deep, deep personal inquiry. Um, but so, um, it is not read by the author. It is read by, um, uh, Julia Whalen, who is a great audiobook um, reader. And in fact, she read, she won multiple awards for her reading of that, that memoir. So that, that's sort of an interesting, I, I listened to that not long after Born a Crime. And that was an interesting sort of contrast for me, like, you know, two, yeah. two memoirs, um, one read by the author and the other read by someone else, um, but both equally effective. That's, I, I gotta say, for audiobooks, memoirs do really well because you could just be immersed with someone's story and someone's life. And sometimes it's like, it's a good way to just, if you're new to audiobooks, memoirs, nonfiction is a good start. And then you build into fiction, you know? Yeah. What are, what are some of your favorite um, memoir audiobooks? So I like celebrity memoirs. I have to admit, like any <laughs> juicy Hollywood kind of like tell all you're trying to figure yeah. out who this person is. I have to tell you, they're just, they're a delight just to do, especially comedians. Like do you get a sense of like who they are beyond just the stuff they're, they're sharing. Um, sure. So I did like Casey Wilson's um, The Wreckage of My Past. I listened to that one recently and it was really good. Like I... I can't identify with certain parts. And I was like, oh, I, you're just like us, you know, celebrity. Yeah. Um, Tiffany Haddish, uh, The Last Black Unicorn is hilarious. Um, oh, she's are great titles. Yeah. So she basically, um, there's a story about Will and Jada Smith, how she bought a Groupon. And so they join her with a, with a Groupon. Like she says, just like us. Mm-hmm. And she go for a swamp thing. They were like, they didn't know what a Groupon was. She's like, a Groupon. <laughs> like, she's like, they're so rich. They don't know what a Groupon is. Yeah. So, yeah. so that was delightful. And then just like, um, I would say Minnie Kellings, I think she has a couple of short stories, but um, Jessica Simpson actually has a really good memoir. I've heard this about hers. I, yeah, that it's really supposed to be terrific. Have you read the Chelsea Handler one? Yes. I read Chelsea Handler's most of them. Most of her books are funny. They're definitely irreverent and they're funny. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah. Did you go into that one or did you read it? I think I read Chelsea Handler. So I read it. I listened to Jessica. I listened to Tiffany and I listened to Casey. Because I'm do like, they read their own? Huh? Do they read their own? Yeah. Okay. So um and yeah, I'm like a I start audiobooks actually about a couple years ago. So it was like it was like a slow introduction to them. And I'm like, that's where I started. And then I just dive into now listening to some fiction and some like just romance or historical fiction and some thrillers. Thrillers do work really well for me in audio. Um, which one i'm sorry say that one more time thrillers do work really well with me for audio what what are what what's one of your what's one of your favorites um was the golden couple is coming out in march it's greer hendrix and sarah peckenden they wrote anonymous girl and um the wife between us and that was actually like um they're they're kind of like suspense they're kind of like women's fiction meets thriller like mystery suspense that was a good one um, the Last Mrs. Parish by Liv Constantine, um, which is another one, women's fiction meets Mr. Thriller, you know? Yeah. So what about, did you, did you listen to Janelle Brown's uh, Pretty Things? That was also a very good audio book. No, but I need to. I'll throw that in as a bonus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, and then I just borrowed the last thing, the last thing he saved, Lord Dave's th- new mystery thriller. Oh, yes, yes, yes. So I just borrowed that one. So that's like my, after the long call, that's going to be my next one. So. <laughs> um, so. Oh, these are great suggestions. Um, I, I always like getting suggestions. In fact, I, I, I'll be honest, like um, Daisy Jones and the Six and Born a Crime were two audiobooks that were recommended to me by my, another historical novelist friend named Elise Hooper, so, who also listens to a lot of audiobooks. And she was like, these are really like, if you're going to listen to them, it's, it's almost better to listen to them than to, yeah. to read them because they're so well, like well read. Yeah. Um, 
So, so, so I'll offer um, one, or if I have time, two more. Yeah. Um, so this one is one. It's like it's it's historical fiction. It's also definitely literary fiction. And I sometimes I worry about literary, you know, we're, you know, capital L, capital F, you know, um, fiction um, that it might feel slower in audiobook. Um, although I have no actual evidence of that. <laughs> um, but Hamnet by uh, Maggie O'Farrell, um, which is, you know, like very loosely based on the life of um, Shakespeare's wife and children. Mm. Uh, and it is, she, you know, uh, it, it's, it's just, it's a fabulous book. And it is so beautifully written and beautifully, beautifully read. Um, in fact, I, uh, let me just, uh, I actually don't know off the top of my head, the name of the audiobook listener, but let I mean, the reader, let me just read her. So her name was L Potter is the name of the, um, the reader. She's, she's British, you know, and she just has the most lovely accent that she reads the, the reads the book in. And she does, she does voices and they're, but they're subtle. Um, and it's just, I listened to it in like the dead of winter last winter, walking my dog, like on the ice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was just, it was so great. I mean, and you know, the lyricism of Maggie O'Farrell's prose really beautifully comes across in the way it's read. Um, and I think, you know, I, 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 it was just, it was great. It, it was a great audiobook. Um, and you know, another one, um, you, so my, my, this is my last one that I thought was a terrific audiobook, but it was sort of, um, I think sort of a high risk audiobook. I mean, obviously it was going to be made into an audiobook, which was Eleanor Oliphant is completely fine. Yeah. Um, have you read that one? I read the book. I did not listen to it. So tell me about the audiobook. Yeah. So because right, like, cause the book is so voicey, right? And first person, it's, it's this deep, deep, deep dive into the psychology of this, of Eleanor Oliphant. Right. And yeah. so, um, I, I, as I was listening to it, I found, and it was great. It was a great audio book. Like, you know, the, the reader seemed, I don't know what, what else the reader has done. This is another one where I had to, um, remind myself, uh, um, of the audio book reader, Kathleen McCarran is the name of the, of the reader. And the author's name is Gail Honeyman. Um, and so I, I found myself wondering, um, I wonder what the author thought of this audio recording, because again, the novel is so voice driven. It's so much about who Eleanor is like, you yeah. know, not if like she wasn't thrilled with the, the audio book reader. And it was funny. I was talking to a friend of mine who's a, a big reader who had just read, read it and had gone to an event. This is before the pandemic gone to an event with the author. And someone asked her this very question. What did you think of the audiobook reader? And yeah. Gail Honeyman said, she's great. You know, I like, it was a, it was a ringing endorsement. Yeah. And I, I thought, I thought to myself, well, few for both of them. Right. Yeah. Um, but so, but, so, but, but, I, and also I felt like my, that was one where I really felt like my listening to the book was truly an authentic reading, right. That the, that because that she, even the author felt that the reader really embodied this character um, yep. that she had invented, which I, I think is not an easy thing. Um, and, and it would be easy for a writer to feel really protective of a character like Eleanor mm -hmm. Oliphant, right? Like yeah. she's so specific. Yeah. Um, anyway, so those are my, those are my, those are my recommendations that I think are great novels that if you want to read them in, you know, with your eyeballs or if you want, but if you want to listen to them, I think that they're especially kind of magical audiobooks. I love this. And I love audiobook recommendations, especially for podcast listeners, because it's a great bridge, you know, to get your reading done while listening to an audiobook. So yes, 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 for sure. I actually didn't think about that, but a hundred percent. 
Yeah. yeah. We're all, li- we're all out there listening, um, <laughs> you know, as we're walking dogs or folding laundry or making dinner or, you know, yeah. whatever, like there are so many times, what are your, some of your favorite times to like, listen to audiobooks at work? <laughs> So I straight, I work from home and I have a lot of tasks that are just like, just, you just have to just data or do this or do that. And I'm like, I just put an audiobook and I just get lost in the story. It's like my favorite way to just, you know, get work done and just get to focus. Um, yeah. So, and you just walk your dog and do all the other stuff. <laughs> I do all the other stuff. Yeah. I mean, like, again, any, anything that doesn't require too much of my brain, I, mm-hmm. I, I like to have an audio book on in the background. And I, I do listen to some podcasts. Um, you know, there are so many wonderful podcasts, <laughs> um, and just like there are so many wonderful audio books, but yeah. I am, I am a very slow reader. Like, Mm -hmm. I'm eyeball reader. Um, so I really, once I realized that audio books were kind of a thing that I could do to increase the amount of reading that I did, I really seized on it. I, I started listening to audio books. I feel like we're living in a, through a real golden age of like audio books right now. Mm -hmm. Like they're so they've, they've become so popular, I think partly because of podcasts. Um, you know, people are just listening, listening, listening all the time now. Um, but I started listening to audiobooks like 15 years ago when I had an hour long commute each way in my car to get to a teach my teaching position. I taught writing, um, and my local library had a terrific collection of, you know, we called them books on tape. <laughs> <laughs> and so I thought they were actually books on CD for the most part. So I would check out, you know, books and listen to them on my car stereo uh, during my commute. Um, and it was the best way to pass that commute time. Yeah. Um, I listened to a little bit of news just so I sort of knew what was going on in the world. <laughs> like 20 minutes of NPR and then 40 minutes of, um, I'll never forget listening to Caleb Carr's The, the Alienist. That was one of my favorites. It, I mean, that was a doorstop of a book. You know, yeah. I've actually gotten through some very long books on audio that I probably would have shied away from, to be totally honest, like yeah. reading because I'm so slow. Yeah. That's amazing. And honestly, in books and tape at that time, you couldn't speed it up or anything. So (laughs) you really had to just slow it down. So that's amazing. You sometimes increase the speed. I do. I increase the speed. Yeah. Me too. Not too much. If if it, I I sometimes I go, I I rarely go above 1.2 because I, at one after 1.2, I find that it starts really sounding funny, like like the Smurfs. <laughs> I'm a 2.0, so but it's I cannot go past that because it's the same thing. It just sounds like sounds like shrink, like little I don't know, like it just sounds like a little squirrel. So, so but you, yeah, yeah. you know, so yeah, yeah. so awesome. Well, t- t- tell us where you can find you online. Oh, okay. Well, so my favorite place to be online is Instagram. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm very active on Instagram. I am also on Facebook on, on Facebook and Instagram. My handle is the same. It's Carrie Mayer writer. So K E R R I M A H E R W R I T E R. Wow. That was a mouthful. Um, but Carrie Mayer writer at on Facebook and, um, Instagram. I also have a website, um, Carrie And I have a newsletter that you can subscribe to through my website and, and the contact link. Um, and so those are all great ways to connect with me. Um, and I love, I love connecting with people and readers. It's like my favorite, like, it's so cool when readers like reach out and like, you know, say something about the book or take a picture of themselves reading the book or, or or respond to something that I've posted about research that I'm doing or whatever. I think that that's, you know, writing, I feel like writers say this all the time, but you you can never say it enough. It's like, it's a, it's a lonely thing. There's no water cooler. Mm -hmm. Um, and so social media really is like the water cooler, you know, we get, and we, where we get to interact with, you know, the people who love it, like we love it. Yeah, that is very true. So Thank you, Carrie, for being in the show. Thank you so much for having me. This was really fun chatting with you. If you enjoyed this podcast, feel free to share with friends, subscribe, rate, and review the show. This is the easiest way to support the podcast. 
Today's episode's partner is Libra FM. If you're an audiobook listener, then you should add Libra FM as your go-to source for paid audiobooks. Libra FM makes it possible for you to buy audiobooks through your local bookstore. Memberships start at $14.95, and they also have great sales for women's audiobooks each month for $3.99, thanks to the Kiss Club. To sign up for Libra FM, please visit whattoreadnextblog.com slash Libra FM. You will receive a free audiobook when you sign up for a monthly subscription. If you purchase a subscription through our link, you will be supporting the podcast at no cost to you. The What to Read Next podcast is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. Please visit frolic.media slash podcast to discover new shows to tune in. Thank you so much for listening and have a great day.